we started from from zero yeah grew to 42 billion and all of that with zero capital i don't mean zero outside capital i mean zero long-term capital nothing that was all sweat equity you're listening to the establishing your empire show a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs creatives and future business owners to pursue their passions grow their organizations and build their empire my name is darren herman and creatively i'm best known for my photography but business-wise my claim to fame is growing a company from 15k per month in online sales to breaking the one million dollar a month barrier and i'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process the lessons they've learned and how they have established their empires Good investment advice can be hard to come by, as you always wonder if you're getting taken advantage of, working with the right people, or making the best decisions. On this episode of Establishing Your Empire, I host Patrick Geddes, and he just released a book titled Transparent Investing, and all net revenues, including net proceeds from the sale of the book, speaking fees, and other incomes will be donated to nonprofits focused on financial education. And in this episode, we explore Patrick's entrepreneurial journey from idea to startup to being acquired by BlackRock for over a billion dollars. All right, I got Patrick here on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. Thank you so much for taking some time and uh, chatting with me today. My pleasure. When somebody has like your elevator pitch, like who is Patrick? Kind of what do you what do you usually say? (laughs) I say I'm the kind of guy who's maybe a bit of a quant and really bad at making the elevator pitch. I am uh, semi-retired. I work 30% time. I have been the co-founder of Aperio Group, an investment management firm that grew to 42 billion in assets by the end of 2020. And now I'm an author of a new book, Transparent Investing. And it's really about a a kind of consumer crusade about get the truth out to investors about what the investment industry can and can't do for them and about the psychological hurdles investors face. So very fixated on the truth, on uh, the emperor's new clothes story. That's who I am. You founded a company back in 1999, but you did a lot of cool things before that. So how did you kind of get your start in this investment world? I actually had no interest in finance or investing until I was about 24, stumbled in it. I was a history major um, and then started taking some courses in it and and found both. I really enjoyed it, much like history, and I was I was good at it, not so much like history. Suddenly, this, this new field kind of opened up and I uh, took a couple of courses at a personal financial planning program and thought, well, why don't I just go and get an MBA? Went and did that. Um, then I worked for five years at an oil company uh, called Amico, now part of uh, BP, and really enjoyed the the finance side, the number crunching, just really, really got into that and learned how to do after-tax risk-adjusted cash flow analysis, something that when I got over to the investment space, I was kind of shocked to discover, why aren't we doing that over there? And I have, it took me 20 years to figure out why. Uh, left Amico and got uh, a call from a friend who uh, was at Morningstar when it was still a fairly young entity. And <clears throat> I'd been living outside of the country and hadn't really heard of them. Got back and got very fortunately offered the job for um, as their uh, their first research director. In fact, I'd been looking to go back and get a PhD in finance. I applied to seven programs and got into zero of those. So I was kind of, I was going to try and apply again the following year, but this Morningstar thing landed in my lap. Uh, did that for three years, became their CFO as well. Then I moved back to California where I'm from. And that's when I met Paul Soley, who was my co-founder. And he never likes it when I describe it this way. He's the entrepreneur and we both did entrepreneurial things, but what I mean by that is when he first said, you know, we could start a company. My first reaction, which is not the normal reaction of an entrepreneur was, you can do that? So kind of stumbled into this entrepreneurial role and then just, you know, very fortunately ended up at a, a place where we uh, we grew it to, to quite a size. 
Do you think that if you wouldn't have met your, your co-founder there that you would have started a company ever? It wasn't my inclination. I, I just don't have that mindset. And, and one of the fortunate things in hindsight is we were a complementary pair. I, I would describe it in a couple of ways. One, um, on the sort of financial side, if he were left to his own devices, we would never have had any profit. If I were left to my own devices, we would never have had any revenue. Um, and similarly, he had really good market vision and branding. And I built our factory and was the chief investment officer and, and, and knew how to run a company. So either of us alone was not going to be able to do anywhere near as much as, as we could as a pair. And that was a very interesting part of the lesson is how do you best tap into each individual's best skill sets and make sure that you don't have the wrong person in the wrong role. That sounds so easy. Yeah. Until you introduce ego and then, then it's always going to be a challenge. Ego is definitely a challenge. Let's go back to, you know, the 1999, 1998, like how did you actually start the company? So you were working for, you know, you had corporate jobs, you were doing this, but yep. did you just get talked into it or, 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 or was there any story that actually got you to get started? Right. Um, it, I was, I, so I'd left Morningstar in 96 and I was teaching graduate level portfolio theory, but I was kind of floundering around. Um, I know you're never supposed to acknowledge that the, the, the track, when you look at the resume, it looks so linear and like, no, nah, I was, I was casting about not quite sure, which I don't see. I just turned 40 in 1998. Um, so he didn't really have to twist my arm because it was an interesting idea and I didn't have much to risk. Um, and we, you know, the interesting thing is we never actually formally agreed handshake. Let's start a company. It was more like each conversation was getting closer and closer to just presuming that kind of like a, a couple that is living together and has never really said, let's move in together. And, and then, uh, then we formally, uh, filed the paperwork in July of, of 1999. And it, you know, it was just two of us when we first started and we even had a bunch of different ideas. We were talking about investment education. We were talking about being more of a wealth management firm. And then the idea we did come up with was kind of both of ours. It was Paul's idea originally to build portfolios around existing positions with a, a heavy risk management offset. So that was his idea. And then I said, you know, if you're going to do that, there's a really interesting tax angle. So we kind of invented it together, although it, it definitely would not have come from me. I just, I don't, I, there's certain areas of creativity where I, where I am, I don't, I don't have it. Certain areas uh, where I lack that kind of creativity. Yeah. And then do you remember, and I just like, love to kind of go back a little bit. Do you remember like your first hire? Was that, was that something that was scary yeah. to you or was that, somebody that you just, you just needed help with or what, what was it? No, it, it was fun. So, so there were just two of us. And then we had a, another partner join a couple months after we got started. Uh, I, Paul uh, brought that fellow in. And then about four years later, we had a fourth one join. And I did say, okay, we're done with hiring partners and kind of spreading around the ownership. Then our first employee was February of uh, 2005. So about six years in. And no, we actually went and interviewed and it was, it was interesting because we were kind of creating the company on the fly. And so, you know, like, what, what's the job description? Well, I'm going to have to walk you through some of, of what I do. It was interesting to, to um, finally get it. Go I mean, it did feel like we were becoming more of a real company. We, we had 890 square feet of space and moved to a huge office with like 2,200, which was just Boy, that was that was gigantic, um, and and that started the the hiring and the uh, it's feeling more like a real entity rather than a than a plan. And then you guys grew to over like a hundred and twenty employees, uh, and like you were saying, yeah. what was it forty oh, forty For, plus billion dollars billion. assets yeah, under we management? We started from from zero, yeah, grew to forty two billion, and all of that with zero capital. I don't mean zero outside capital. I mean, zero long-term capital, nothing. That was all sweat. And that, that is absolutely amazing. What, in order to get there, was there 
uh, a different approach that you guys had, or was there some kind of secret sauce or something that just really got you all, you know, all these, um, clients and, and different, uh, got you all the different, uh, portfolios, right? Yeah. So, so getting traction was hard and people would ask me maybe three, um, even maybe four years in, how's it going? And my answer was, well, we're too much of a success to be labeled a failure, but we're too much of a failure to be labeled a success. I mean, we were limping along. It didn't look at that point as though it was very clear if it was going to provide actually a sustainable living. Uh, our, the firm's uh, later tax account, I actually did the uh, first tax returns myself, but later we, we hired someone and he said, you told me once that you only started the company because you wanted a job. And that was actually true in that I really liked the investment space. I, I enjoyed my time at Morningstar. I really loved finance on the quant side, but I never wanted to work at a company where I would have to lie. And in my, by my very prickly, rigid standards, that would be about 98% of the companies in the financial services world would be disqualified. So that was my goal. I want to work in this industry, but I can't sell people stuff that's that's unfair or, or, or not, not warranted. And so how, back to your question, how do we get the traction? We were early in, in this <clears throat> sort of custom indexing tax law service. And one of our big competitors was already established and had been the real trailblazer. And it was a lot of networking, a lot of contacts. That was the part my partners did because I'm a terrible networker. My, I, I used to joke that my, uh, my idea of marketing, if I we ran a sushi restaurant, would be, hey, you want some cold dead fish? <laughs> like just not the right touch you need. And similarly, the sort of opening doors, like calling people and and uh, you know trying to set up meetings, that was not my thing. I could sell our our you know our baby once I was brought in to do a sales situation. So it wasn't as though I couldn't do sales, but I couldn't do those introductions. So my partners did the really hard work early on of of that, that perseverance. Now the, the problem is entrepreneurs are always hearing, you gotta have perseverance. That's true, but I would define that as a necessary but insufficient condition because you can persevere on something that's just never gonna go anywhere. And it's always a challenge. Like when do you throw in the towel? Sometimes it is probably healthier to, to, to cut your losses, but it certainly takes a lot of patience and perseverance. The thing that kept me in it was I wasn't going to go get a job at another company. So that sort of forced me to stick with it. And, you know, in hindsight, that was a good call, but you never know at the time what, uh, how things are going to turn out. So explain to the audience of what tax loss harvesting is. And because there, even as a person, you could do this now, it's probably not as beneficial as a company, but maybe give a brief overview of what that is. Sure. So the idea is take the basic concept in stock investing of indexing, where you own everything. You're not trying to beat the market and it's very cheap. Take that and apply it to a situation where you're not buying a, an index mutual fund, you're actually buying every single underlying stock or, or most of them. And then we would use a risk model to make sure that that portfolio looked almost identical to a benchmark like the S&P 500, like the Russell 3000. And then, of course, if you own you know, 400 stocks, a bunch of them are going to be up and a bunch will be down at any point in time. The idea is, well, what if you just like held the winners and sold the losers, but but repurchase stocks to keep the profile looking the same? So if we use the example of like you own Pepsi and Coke. Sorry, you own Pepsi and it goes down, you sell it and buy Coke. Or you own Coke and it goes down, you sell it and buy Pepsi. So you're you're keeping your soft drink and other sort of variable exposure um, fairly constant, but you are generating real genuine losses. These are not fake. These are not made up losses. You actually have them in your brokerage account. And you can add, actually, especially for the, the very high income uh, taxpayer, you can add uh, not a, a wow, knock your socks off kind of extra return, but it's very dependable, unlike a lot of investment strategies. And that's the basic idea of uh, tax loss harvesting. Yeah. I mean, even the way that I've always uh, thought of it and 
in a very simplistic way is, hey, if it's at the end of the year and you had some gains and you had some losers, if you don't think the losers are going to do well, get rid of them to at least you, so you can write it off on taxes, right? And to yeah. offset some yeah. of your wins. Um, right. I, I do think it's interesting to actually keep, to rebuy in the same genre or same area. That I actually haven't thought of. I love that. Um, let's, let's talk about investing actually. So there's sure. the retail investors that's everywhere. So I actually run a private Facebook group called six street bets. So six street, I'm in Austin, Texas It's a famous street. It's kind of the wall street bets, but uh, you know, smaller scale down and, yep, yep. uh, way more personable. Um, what have you, how, how has that affected the markets that you see? Or I don't even know where to take it really, but I think it's, I think so many people are excited about investing today. Have you seen that in the past? And what do you think the future is going to hold or wherever you want to take kind of the investment, retail investment question or area? Sure. So retail investing is very interesting because its popularity is highly correlated with how the U.S. stock market is doing. So investing was something everybody talked about in 1999, but in 2002, everybody was really depressed by it and, and didn't want to. Uh, didn't want to talk about it. So that's just a sort of standard baseline around human psychology, which I think is an under-emphasized component of investing. What's been interesting is watching the evolution of that intersection of technology and investing and this kind of what I would say started as a, as a really healthy innovation around what's called fintech, the financial technology side, that I think now has become, as is often the case, kind of overblown and a little hyped as in it's going to solve everything. And as a, a more cynical friend of mine puts it, yeah, there's, it seems to be there are a lot of companies inventing solutions for problems that aren't, that aren't actually there. So the, the fintech side is very real in that it's like what we did it, when we started in 1999, you couldn't have done that 20 years earlier because the technology simply wasn't there to make it as easy as it was to be trading like that, um, that easily, which of course we, we did all electronically. And similarly for retail investors, I, I guess the counsel I would give is the technology can be beneficial, can be really fun, but be very careful that it doesn't distract you from the underlying reality. And I see a lot of that going on. There's things like you hear about the, the gamification of investing. And that I find very disturbing that, that why is the gamification of investing a thing? It's because it makes firms a lot of money. The, because when you get people constantly tweaking their portfolios, constantly trading, they're little bid ask spreads that add up, that generate a lot of money. The problem is that the, the conundrum for an investor is that we're wired to be very excited to get our dopamine hits from all the activity that is basically a bad idea. And the stuff that's a really good idea is boring, uninteresting, and anything but sexy. And, and it's almost like we have to talk ourselves out of the fun stuff in order to have a lot more money, which everyone of course says, but obviously my goal is to have a lot more money. Yeah, then why do you keep playing at a game that is not likely to pay off when the smartest thing to do is invest in capitalism, take a 20, 30 year time horizon, assuming that is your time horizon, and just don't look at your portfolio. But that that's not good clickbait, let's put it that way. There's there's the fear of missing out. You see somebody that Yo, made five hundred percent in one yep. in one day, you know. And, and I've been over I here can't making three percent trades. Yeah, I, I've been making all these three percent, you know, net trades and seven percent. And um, so let's talk about your book then. That I think it's a good segue. Sure. You know, transparent investing is the title, and I love the uh, subtitle, How to Play the Stock Market Without Getting Played. So why don't you give us an overview of the book real quick, and then we'll dive into it. Sure, sure. So the 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 book is yet another investment book. So let's start off. This is back to the uh, sushi cold dead fish. In some ways, yeah, it's another boring <laughs> investment book. The new angle is to try and take two bodies of research and apply them in really useful, practical ways for um, 
all ranges of investors, um, the, the lowest end retail and the ultra wealthy. So the two areas of research, uh, the first one is what's called behavioral finance, this, this intersection of psychology and, uh, and economics or finance, and sometimes behavioral economics being a broader term there. And that's, that's gained some traction. That's, that's an accepted field now, whereas when, like we, when we started Aperio, even academia was like, this isn't a real finance and investing degree, like this behavioral thing. And now people have been winning Nobel Prizes, and it's very much uh, accepted, appropriately so. The research on that is all about how our brains are hardwired from through evolution to make poor investment choices. Uh, the biggest ones I emphasize are a couple that are very closely related. One's called uh, overconfidence, which incidentally, uh, as males, we're slightly more susceptible to than women. Women are slightly better investors, not because they know what's going to happen. Women have uh, very little success at financial forecasts. Males equally lack any ability to forecast, but we think we can. So the women do a little better because they, in effect, think, well, I don't know what's going to happen, so I'm not going to do anything. And the men are like, well, you know, I'm a guy. Of course I know what's going to happen. The other one's uh, called the illusion of control, where, where as humans, if we're told, no, you don't control something, it's random. <laughs> yeah, You don't know me. Uh, Darren, I control my own life. Take those two together as, as a, we basically kind of delude ourselves. We can do stuff we can't. That's the first body research. Second body is uh, more well understood, which is the active indexing debate around particularly stock investing, that active management has destroyed value over long periods of time on average. There's really no way around that. That's an incredibly well-documented uh, phenomenon, but it's really, really bad for the industry's revenue if people understand that. So the second piece is about the industry and then the parts where investment experts can add a lot of uh, value, but only if you get rid of the parts where they can't, which I distill down to anything signaling a crystal ball, you want to run screaming from that. Anyone who tells you they can beat the market or time the market, very bad news. The track record is clearly awful. So take those two issues, this industry, like a consumer activist angle and a psychological angle of, of if you want to be a good investor, you got two hurdles, your own mind, your own brain's wiring, and this industry that wants to capitalize on that. And then the third part of the book is, all right, you've sort of depressed me and changed my mind. Like, what do I actually do? What I've found in some of the feedback I've gotten is the part that was never explained is, should I do this myself or should I hire someone? And the problem is that the answer to that question comes either from the industry. What do you think they're going to say? Do it myself or pay someone They want you to hire them. Yeah, exactly. So that's biased. Or there's a kind of cynical, the whole industry is a bunch of shysters and it's just a ripoff. You need to do it yourself. That's even for me, that's too cynical. So there's a, a, a guide in the book, a kind of questionnaire to walk you through. Should you try and do it yourself? Should you hire someone? What it boils down to is, what do you want out of this? What do you want out of an investment advisor? And there are a lot of great things like financial planning, um, what I call kind of one-off situations where, you know, portfolio recommendations are always predicated on, you start with a lump of cash, whatever it is, 10,000, 100,000, 10 million. How would you invest it? But in reality, everybody's lives, especially if you're a little older, is it's a mishmash. You got a bunch of stocks. Maybe you bought early and you held on. You got an IRA rollover. You got your 401k. You got some mutual fund, a broker put you in. And it's this kind of messy, not terribly well thought out collection of stuff. And can you help me put my arms around that? That can be actually a very useful guidance or, or advice. All that stuff is healthy. The part that's unhealthy, hey, can you, you beat the market for me? You're already in trouble. You think you're going to beat the market? You think you're hiring somebody so they can help you beat the market? Again, the data there are very, very heavily stacked. You are likely to be a lot poorer by trying to do that, which just to the, back to the human brain. Wait, 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 Patrick, wait, wait, wait. You're telling me I'm going to be richer by aiming lower? And especially, you know, your, your, your audience, like entrepreneurs, 
there is a, a passion and a grass is greener that's great. It achieves wonderful breakthroughs sort of, you know, in economics and artistically and medical and science. But in investing, it's one area where humility actually makes you a lot richer. And you want to talk about counterintuitive. That's the hard, sell, uh, difficult challenge of selling this book is it's so boring and it's so simple that that can't be the right answer. Thing is, I got all this data saying, yep, that is actually the right answer. And I think you already uh, answered this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway is, okay, let's say I know that I'm my own worst enemy, that I get excited, that I think that I'm smarter than what I am. I have some fear of missing out. What do I, I but let's say I know all that now. I've, I've, I've yep. read the first part of the book. I read it. Yep. What do I actually do? How do I get out of, get out of my own way? That's a, that's a really nice way of phrasing it. Um, the kind of investing I'm recommending, it's very simple, but it's not easy. It takes a real kind of discipline. It's why they're like weight loss programs where one of the things they do is build in a kind of social construct to help keep everybody in line in a healthy way as, as a, a group. So specific challenge you're, you're raising is how do you make sure you don't do stupid stuff? And it's one of the things I put in the how to determine whether you should do it yourself or you need an advisor. And there's a kind of hand-holding component that's very real and not to be dismissed. In fact, a lot of advisors have told me, I think that's where we add the most value. And I would agree with that. It's like they're acting as, as counselors or coaches or therapists. And so to your question, how do I get out of my own way? The more tempted you are, the more seduced by the, the glitz and the, the sexy, cool stuff and being in the in crowd, the more you might, ironically, the more you might actually think about hiring someone who will keep you on the straight and narrow. The, in, in, a, in an odd way, it's like what the book is saying is that the hardcore hobbyists who really love investing, in a way, they have the bigger challenge because change, you know, you're undercutting their belief system and you're taking away all the fun. And that's one thing that I will never help hope to defend about indexing. Like, isn't indexing really, really boring? Absolutely. Yes. Dull, bland. You are not going to be the cool guy at the gym or, you know, the cool woman at the garden party bragging about your inside tips and your private, like, you know, you have a couple mutual fund index funds and that's it. Like, oh, man, what a dull person. I would, I wouldn't want to go out with you. I, oh yeah. Okay. So the odds are stacked that you'll be, have twice as much money as I will, but I, I don't want to acknowledge that because that would mean a, giving up my illusion. So I, you know, there's a little hyperbole thrown in there, but that's the basic challenge. And the more, the more challenging it is to, to decouple from that allure, the harder the program I'm talking about is going to be not harder because it's, it's, conceptually or mathematically challenging, but good investing is about good behavior. And that's, uh, can be a breakthrough and also kind of unwelcome and a letdown. I think it's perfect timing for that message with the market changing right now, not being as, uh, exciting as 2020 was, uh, and also a <laughs> yep. lot of people losing a lot of money, you know, yep. down 50%, 60%, 70% yep. of the portfolios, yep. uh, because they were, you know, uh, going all in on some, uh, meme stocks Crazy or stuff. whatever they were doing. Yep. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And I get myself in that too. I, not so much in the cra too crazy, but, um, trying to pick winners, trying to see the market before it happens, a lot of that stuff, but I do get enjoyment out of that too. So, um, I, I I'm more of a, I'm going to do both of it. I'm going to have it to where I'm actively managing it myself and a small percentage. And then the rest is just, you know, Vanguard, really, really inexpensive yep, yep. index funds. Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually, I, I I wouldn't be surprised if that approach you're talking about actually gains some traction and becomes more popular. This idea of, you know, we need a little fun in our lives. We don't want to all be dour Calvinists like Patrick Geddes is telling us to be. Can't I carve out 10, 15% of my portfolio? Have fun, go to town, do research, find the winners, but 
my retirement's based on the 85% that's boring. And maybe that'll actually become a great model. So the, what you're talking about is slightly um, contradicted by my book, but who knows, maybe maybe I need to develop it and get even more sophisticated around human psychology and say, all broccoli and no chocolate cake is a pretty boring diet. And, and, and even though it's only 10 or 15%, if you make 500 bucks or $1,000 off of what you did, sometimes that's more exciting than making $100,000 over the course of time that somebody else did. So why write a book? Why even, why even do it? Because I have a serious thorn up my backside at watching dishonesty and let's call it lying. And the investment industry is one I know very well. And it, you know, lots of industries are, have, are a little challenged. I mean, no industry wants completely informed consumers. It's not as easy to sell people stuff when they know the real story. But investing, boy, that's got a big impact on people's lives where they are consumers, but they're also looking at their financial future. And to watch the amount of money being siphoned off from people's retirement into the revenue coffers of an industry that's not, that's frequently not very honest. I, I'm not, I'm not throwing the industry under the bus. It's got, does a lot of great things. There's some, there's some honorable players. There's some real value. It's like a lot of human endeavors. It's a mixed bag. The reason I wrote this book is um, also came out of a, you know, what you call it, like a, a, not a spiritual crisis, a moment when a Perio was still limping along and I thought, you know, this actually could turn into something. If it hits this certain level, I'm committing, I'm going to do something to repay the generosity uh, pouring in on, on top of me. And then the, that good thing happened and a Perio did grow. And I've kind of been in arrears for, I don't know, eight or 10 years. I, I'm behind on my debt payment and I'm I'm so relieved that the book is out because the purpose of this book was to try and help people as consumers. Because when I'm a consumer looking at an area I don't understand well, uh, there are many many um, uh, like like uh, uh, contractors dealing with home home projects. Like you know, I've actually done a, when I was in high school bits of construction. I'm not completely close, but I, I don't know how to think about it or start? How do you make sure you're not getting ripped off? And I get so intimidated by it and sort of frustrated. You try and do research. It's all basically sales pitches or uh, along those lines, like I had a plumber come in once who was putting in a faucet and I said, oh, can you check out a couple of toilets that I, it's got minor problems? And he walked around, he actually went to three of them and said, okay, that one, you got the wrong lever. You need to replace it. This one, ah, yeah, you need to replace the whole plunger. You know how to do that? Actually, I do. Okay, and you need to change the feed valve. And the third one, there was some other minor problem. And it took him like 11 minutes to address these three problems. And it just struck me as, would it be cool if in the investment world, you had something like that? Tell me the real story, not the one that makes you the most money. And so this book is my effort to pay back some generosity and be that plumber who helped me because I didn't know what the story was and his expertise was so valuable. The problem with buying expertise is the person of whom you're asking the question, how much of your expertise do I need has a vested interest in the answer to that. And so the book is trying to tell people, if you look at investing as a consumer for, actually the suggestion is, don't think of yourself as an investor first. Think first as a consumer and as this biological entity that came out of evolution of Homo sapiens have been around, what, three, 400,000 years? How you're wired, those are the two most important things. Then start thinking of yourself as an investor. So the book is an effort to try and help the consumers who are intimidated by the process, intimidated by the game, and that's the, hence the title, how to play the market without getting played. And you mentioned earlier that if somebody says, hey, that they can beat the market, that's like a red flag and run. Any other red flags or things that you hear that you just cringe or you should, yeah. or should people yeah. should be aware of? Sure. So um, free is a dangerous word in the investment world. When you hear free, 
you want to start thinking, okay, people only do stuff in this industry when they're getting paid somehow. Where's the cut? You got you to gotta look for it. So, for example, I, uh, I was once doing some uh, volunteer uh, tax returns for low-income people with this very nice woman who worked at an insurance office. She said, yeah, and sometimes we do a little bit on the investing side and we you know, put people in mutual funds and we don't charge them anything. It's free. And I heard that and just like the red flag went up. Wait a minute. Are you talking about, and then I got, you know, some techie language. Are you talking about 12B1 class B share load mutual funds? And she said, yeah. And I was like, you don't want the SEC hearing you say that because you're telling something they consider misleading and dishonest and you could get fined for it. It's not free. You're paying 1% of your portfolio every year for five years. That ain't free. You're not writing a check. That's very different. You're paying a lot of money. So you ask for what red flags. Uh, always pay attention to the economic incentive of anyone giving you advice, which sounds a little cynical, but and apply that to everyone. Apply that to me. That was why uh, when I was coming close to this book getting published, some of my uh, um, the folks helping me out and advising me said, you know, you keep talking about this conflict of interest in the industry. Why don't you just donate all the proceeds from the book? And then you can clarify you're not, you know, you're not in the wealth management business. You're not trying to generate a name for yourself. And all the money's going to financial literacy. And I was it's kind of embarrassing to realize, like, gee, that's kind of obvious once you say it, but I had to have them them prompt that. So that's the 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 role of the book is wake up and smell the coffee. Look at the fees, be very wary of the, the promises of outperformance and be wary of investment experts who use jargon to, to browbeat you. Like if they can't explain it in simple terms, your, your radar should go up around what's going on here. Uh, and there's a, there's a kind of a, I call it the don't worry your pretty little head about it school of investment advice. That should set off some alarm bells as in, well, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound uh, justifiable. And, uh, it, and it's hard because sometimes investment advisors tell you stuff you may not understand that's actually really, really useful and, and of value. So it's, it's, it's tricky. Let's talk about actually writing a book, right? So I'm actually in the process of writing a book and um, pretty far along, but then, you know, getting stuck, going through some, you know, ups and downs. And it's, sometimes you sprint and then you stop. Any advice of how you or <laughs> any stories of how you actually wrote the book, any um, routines, sure. anything that helped along the way? Yeah. yeah. So this, again, depends on personality type. I do really well with professional coaches. Like when I was a CEO, I had a professional coach and I was sort of baffled. Like, why wouldn't everyone want this? Because my coach was really good at um, nurturing the parts of me that were really strong that I was best at, making sure they came out and blossom. And either um, sort of polishing or, or toning down the, the, the parts where I was weaker, particularly like around conflict management. And it was great because I was with my, my coach and I would rant with her about some friction I had, you know, normal, we all have in any, any work interaction, you, you know, homo sapiens, you're going you're to have trouble. And so um, I had a coach do that. And I just thought, why doesn't everyone want this? And a friend of mine said, you know, it depends on your psychological profile because some people are not going to follow directives from outside. And I, learn uh, that I'm actually someone who will not follow directives that are internally generated, but I will follow instructions really well. I'm kind of obedient in this weird, rebellious way. So I'm like a perfect fit for that. So how did I write the book? I, I had an editor who was terrific at the developmental side. I've had people compliment, wow, it's a beautiful read. And I'm like, oh man, you should have seen what I started with before you make a comment. I got a lot of professionals buffing and polishing. The other thing my editor did that was uh, uh, so great, this, the, the firm is called The Writer's Ally, um, was she just set down the discipline. She's like, Patrick, you're going to write 30 minutes first thing in the morning, which for me was ended up being like 5.30 a.m. 
And I said, I, every day, I think I can maybe three days a week, but like every work day, she's sorry. You want to get this book. You have to do it every day. And by the way, in two weeks, I need to see that chapter four that you said you can finish up because I think we're far enough along. And it's not as though she helped facilitate that or sped it up. There is no way I would have written an actual book without this coach telling me I had to deliver, just like a coach in a gym or a diet coat, whatever. So I don't know if that works for everyone. I don't know if that would work for you. That was enormously helpful for me because it kept me on track. I just sort of viewed it as, wow, it's kind of like buying willpower. I don't have the willpower to do it. But if you can hire someone to browbeat you, and of course, they're, they're good enough that they nudge. Um, that's the only reason uh, that that book got done. The other bit of advice I'd, I'd add is um, whatever amount of discipline you have and the perseverance that, you know, this is, this is hard. It's like birthing a company or a child. And uh, after I'd, I'd written everything, I, people would say, well, you've done the hard part. You've written the book. Now you just got to promote it. Like for me, the promoting was at least as much work and it was more the stuff I'm both bad at and don't like. And it's just, oh, promoting is, is so hard. I had somebody else helping me do that when we started a period. And he would look at me as like, wow, how do you know how to do this tax quant stuff and build this automated fact? Like, I couldn't do that. I was like, no, you couldn't. But you look at the marketplace and see where it's going. And I look at the marketplace and think, wow, I'm sure there's some trends going on. I have no way of spotting them. I have no idea. So there's a kind of humility piece there. And around a book, get help if if that's feasible or friends, something you know, like a writer's group, something to kind of keep you on track. And it's a long haul. And I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, it's always worth it. it. It's feeling right now as though, am I glad I did it? Yeah, but you could have talked to me many of those 530 in the morning thing. But good habits make for good investing. The same thing for writing. I I squirmed and resisted my coach telling me you got to write for at least half an hour every day. And about three weeks into it, it was just like, oh, you know, that was, that was life. I had to write every morning for half an hour. I was not allowed to uh, deviate from that. And once that was normal, I was fine and I could, I could deliver it. You know, sometimes I'd feel a little like, I don't want to be here, but I only have another 25. Okay. I'll, I'll get it done. And, and that worked. I think that routine is powerful because you're doing it before you're checking emails and going through all these exactly. things to cloud your cloud your head up. Exactly. One of the problems I've been doing is I've been doing it after I get what the half to done. And then it's yeah. really hard to kind of get in book mode, right? You know. And, well, and, and it's and it's you, funny you can always find draw more that. things to do. It, it's it's exactly like um saving. And, and, and one of the things I don't talk about at all in the book is like spending and saving and budgeting. And again, that's really hard. One of the tricks I've always read about there is pay yourself first, always do your savings, and then you'll figure out how to work the rest in. Similarly to your time budgeting, as it were, if you pay off your book first, the other stuff, you got to do it. So while that sounds a little backwards, that might be the way. I don't know if it's in the day or a certain prioritization. I'm also a big believer in, you know, we're, we're weird creature. I, I look in the mirror. I know I'm a weird creature. I look at other humans. I think we're all a pretty weird uh, collection. And everybody's got their oddball quirks and traits. Whatever trick works for you is great. So like one of mine was when I was working really hard, um, and feeling overwhelmed, one of the disciplines that helped me like avoid procrastination, this sounds completely contrarian and backwards, was I would force myself around the time off, not around the work piece. So it was like, you know, I've not gotten enough time off. So like last uh, July, August, September, I think I took four days off in those three months, including weekends. So it was it was harsh. It was like like when we were going to the company, I was working my backside. Up. And the way I would get to a healthier place was not or, or more productive was not, OK, I need to work every single day. It was actually all right. This is getting bad. I need to 
carve all of Sunday out. That is forbidden. And I would make that commitment. Like, you don't have to work on Saturday, but you're forbidden from working on Sunday. And knowing how my mind works and the way I am in some ways disciplined, in some ways like to cheat and slide, like Saturday, I'd be like, I don't want to be doing this. I'll do it tomorrow. You're not allowed to do it tomorrow. That means I have to do it tomorrow. All right. And I would actually get the work done Saturday and then take Sunday. And like Sunday evening, I would just be, what a blessing. I got a whole day off from that inner Calvinist. So I would, again, not recommend that for most personalities. If you're weird the way I am, that works really well. If whatever way you're weird, find some sort of trick the way it, it, you approach all discipline, you know, um, exercise, diet, saving, meditation, you know, a religious practice or or, you know, I, I have, to, I'm, a, I'm a painter and I have to paint an hour a day or I'll go, no, you better carve that out. Whatever, whatever works, it's the same thing. Plan your day or their day will play on you, plan your year or the year will just oh. happen, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Aperio Group got acquired by uh, BlackRock. Everything's fantastic. You just got a book. Okay. What, give us like five years out, to, you know, in the future. Like, what, <laughs> what's your next step? What, what, what anything else going to happen? <laughs> Falling on that advice you just gave of if you don't plan the year, the year will plan you. Um, I just want to get through this launch. I would like to turn this into more than a book to a real movement, a real consumer activist movement. However, I've had some folks saying, well, you need to hire some people, and build an organization. And I heard that. I was like, no, no, I did that. I built a company and I bet I could be effective with that. It's exhausting. I don't want to do that. So I'm hoping to find some sort of balance of the fulfillment from the consumer activism, some nonprofit stuff, some volunteer work I do, but also, as I was saying earlier, like carve out that playtime. Like you need some downtime, and especially. So uh, we're 23 years since since I co-founded Aperio. I need a little downtime, but not too much. I asked my wife, uh, probably five, eight years ago. What do you think about me and retirement, like how that'll work out? And uh, she said, knowing you, your, your personality, you will self-destruct if you don't have a receptacle for your energy. You got to be doing something. And I was like, wow, all right, this woman. And so at the time, you know, has been living with me for uh, between 20 and 30 years. I better pay attention to that. And similarly, my um, my uh, executive coach was was complimenting me when, when I did go into semi-retirement 30% time. She said, wow what's so cool is you've kind of built this other life and it's there you can step into. I'm, I'm impressed with that. And I just looked at her and said, Sue, you told me that's what I had to do. That's the only reason I did that. You said, build that life you want to lead because I asked her four or five years ago, how do I avoid the problem of thinking my life starts once I go into semi-retirement? She said, you got to construct it. So what am I going to do to answer, try and answer your question in five years? I don't know. I hope it's some fun blend of, of some relaxation, some, you know, in a world where we could travel more easily, that would be great. Right now, the working as a consultant for 30% time is great. I really like that. I, I wouldn't want it to be 50. That'd be too much. I wouldn't want it to be zero. I like the engagement, the intellectual stimulation. And so... I'd continue that for a while where this, this self-righteous evangelical pulpit thumping uh, consumer activist take on the industry thing goes. I have no idea. It could, you know, be an interesting little fizzle that's in six months is quickly forgotten and so be it. Or what if it actually gets traction? Just want to keep it really grounded in. This is supposed to be my repayment. So the only requirement is, it can't be about me with the one caveat of I do not want to pour 100% of my energy and life into it. So that was a very long-winded and meandering way of not even really answering your question, but hopefully at least addressing the next five years in my life. Well, the, the question is more for you, I think, than anything. But um, so, okay, you know, you found this company way back in 1999, you were saying, you know, 23 yeah. years ago. Any regrets along the way? No sort of business path regrets. I. I obviously, we all sort of regret the less pleasant part of our own personality. 
So yeah, I have regrets around, I wish I'd been less testy. And, and you know, I wish I'd been a little more emotionally, spiritually mature. That's, you know, it's the reality of, hey, you, you are who you are. Um, this will sound not very helpful, but I, I'm actually sort of stunned at how this path turned into this sort of major company that, that, that then got um, acquired. That was not part of the plan. And I really feel as though if you could go back and do things differently, what would you do differently? I and mean, this almost sounds like superstition, but think of my grounding and indexing. Like, no, 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 I wouldn't want to do that. If I had to do it over again, I'd mess it up. It'd be a lot worse. Like I was so lucky, so fortunate. Oh, I wouldn't want to touch anything because of how unlikely it was that it turned out that way. And And the gratifying parts were actually around the culture and the kind of my fixation on how much power corrupts um, not just decisions and actions, but like it, power corrupts your consciousness. And I was sort of fixated on this with, wow, I'm a CEO and in a privately held company, ours in particular, I, I didn't just have a lot of clout. I mean, I couldn't do absolutely anything I wanted, but I had enormous power. And that made me realize, hey, Patrick, you've always been bitching and whining and moaning about unhealthy corporate cultures. Let's see how you do, Sonny, at trying to, to nurture a healthy one. And as many tough lessons, ooh, that's a lot easier to complain about how it's done badly rather than do it right yourself. So I'm, I'm giving you almost the exact opposite answer to your question of, of regrets. It's more like that fixation I'm, is the part I'm actually the most sort of gratified by and proud and proud of like the financial success was cool. That was a good thing. I liked it. It enables me to do a lot of this stuff with the, and, you know, donate the proceeds of the book, but the real, the thing, like I, I tend to view my life as what are you going to look at on your deathbed that was good and what was bad? Okay. Do the stuff that's good now and stay away from the stuff that's bad and trying to get a culture that was focused on two groups of people, the customers, the clients, as in, Treat them the way that plumber treated you in that earlier story. Like, treat them the way you like your vendors to treat you. And then similarly for the staff, if I wouldn't have wanted to work at a perio at the lowest rung on the ladder as an entry-level person, that meant I was a catastrophe as a CEO. It meant everything I'd stood for sort of ethically and all my bitching and whining about, about um, unhealthy company cultures was all for naught and I was a fraud. So I, that was very, very hard, but really gratifying to watch the world, which is so used to being sort of BSed and played. And I, I describe it as companies, I think, tend to view both their, their clients and their staff to too great an extent as a dish rag from which they attempt to wring the most moisture. And that's gross. And what, I wouldn't claim that acting more sort of honorably to both of those groups, your, your customers and your, your staff, is going to make you wealthier. But I will say it doesn't mean you'll be worse off financially. We ended up establishing this reputation as someone you could actually trust. And we had quite low turnover. And you know, obviously, you need to ask the staff, not me. It's a lot easier for me to say that as a former CEO. But that was the achievement that, that really meant the most to me. Um, and that, back to regrets, that's the thing I think I would have regretted if, if we hadn't stuck to that. And that was my, you could call it passion, let's be more honest, that was my like fixation, obsession, just you, you got to tell the truth. And that the company name is the Latin verb to make clear, reveal the truth. That applies both externally and internally. And humans do not like the truth all that much because it undercuts our narrative and the stuff that makes us feel good. And so I, as I said, I'm just so glad we were able to get at least some uh, ethically honorable cultural um, behavior established. And now what I was going to say there too is it's no wonder that you named your book transparent, use the word transparent because you're extremely transparent even in these questions of, of how, it mattered so much, even just at every level of the company of, of what you were saying 
it, what, if you said something, it needed to, it needed to be the truth. It needed to be real. Um, what about if we go back, you know, let's, since we're going back again, let's go back all the way to your, you know, your high school self, 16 year old self. What, what, what piece of advice would you give yourself way back then? <laughs> I, I'm not, you're going to think this is a flippant answer. High school, high school, I think I might actually give myself some advice like, Later in life, the stuff you're going to regret is not paying enough attention to where when you're interacting with people, how you might cause them pain or suffering. And you need to pay really close attention to that because you will feel better about yourself, put it in very selfish terms, the more you're looking out for others. But I, the reason I was sort of chuckling when you said, what advice would you give to to me as an adolescent, let's say uh, like when I, when I was in the, in my MBA program, so late twenties, what advice would I give that guy at say age 27? I'm not making this up. I've said this a number of times. If I could meet me at 27, I would ask him for advice. I'd be like, you seem kind of like grounded. You're doing this fun thing and you've got this sort of light hold on the reins and there's a lightness to you that I don't have at 63. What should I do? And of course the 27 year old me would be like, but you've been through it all. Like, I, I know, but you know, I, like I got, here's the bad news, Sonny. I don't necessarily have it figured out. And I, I think you had it at least as figured out as I might. And what do you think I should do? So if I could talk to me at 27, I'd ask him for, for insights. The me as an adolescent, I, yeah, I would throw that one in as, as watch out for inadvertent and, and unconscious harm you might do to others it's not going to feel good selfishly. You're not going to, I heard a great uh, line from an old friend of mine when we were talking about marriage and he said, you know what really improved my marriage? I said, what? Realizing that on a purely selfish basis, just looking out for my own interest, the better I treated my wife, the happier I was going to be. I was like, good lesson there. And And what I really like about that is no bones about trying to be honorable, compassionate. You know, he's not he's not aspiring to the Dalai Lama's advice. He's like selfishly looking out for number one. I've got to treat my spouse better. And I, I just it's I so that, that is so uh, true though. The energy changes when everybody's happy. You talk to each other better. I mean, everything's and I, we talk about that at my, my wife and I, and we have a fantastic relationship, but it's like, you know, we got to be able to lift each other up from the beginning. You know, don't let's not start yep. wrong. Like, let's try to start well. And then, you know, if things are going to get off the rails. Sometimes it's going to happen. But uh, at least try to make each other happy. And, and and what's funny about that, too, is I feel like when you do that a little bit, you're going to do it more and more and more. Like if I do something small to make her happy, I'm going to do another thing small or, and then a medium thing small, you know, and I'm going to constantly it's, it, be doing it's back it. to the, the behavior. It's good habits. And similarly in a co company culture, the healthier the culture is, the easier it is for everybody to behave a little better. And the, especially you gotta, you gotta lock down unhealthy behavior. Like we had a very serious conflict management policy, like all conflicts got to be out on the table, no triangulating backbiting conversation. And I say that as one who would, fall into that trap. And so the the good habits come out of or are easier to to maintain in good situations and in that kind of social uh construct. In fact, I was uh, on the same line. I was just chatting with a in fact it was the same friend who who um who made the comment about uh his wife. We have different political views, but I have enormous respect for him because unlike almost everyone else I know, He's very respectful about views that are different from his. And I was t telling him how much I admired that. And he said, well, you know, I have buttons that get pushed. It's just you happen to not push them. And it made me realize that when I was around him, I could let my defenses down. And I could say things like, you know, I'm not really sure about this point, which you don't want to give that if you're in a debate, a serious battle. And it was because he was so non-threatening, respectful, you know, kind of a mature guy. And that enabled me to bring my best self. And that 
kind of help reinforce our interaction to where there were points and we'd be talking politics and I'd be defending his party saying, no, no, you're being too hard on them. You got to look at it this way. And I was like laughing. Like, okay, this is, this is an interesting world. Cause that was, that was a different, that was like 25 years ago in today's world. Um, very hard to do, but same mindset of try and bring self-awareness and a, uh, a worshipful attitude around the truth. And what I mean by worshipful is how do you know the truth? You only know the truth because it makes you unhappy. If what you think is the truth always makes you happy, you're lying to yourself. You're feeding what your, what your ego and unconscious wants. You're not really poking around. The real truth makes you unhappy, just like self, real self-awareness is not going to make you, I'm projecting here from me. It's like, Oh, I had to learn another obnoxious trait of I have plenty of, and I got to learn an oh, what's the look at Socrates line the unexamined life is, is not worth living. Yeah, well the examined life is excruciatingly painful. Oh, what a pair of choices, the one that's not worth living and the one that's painful. But that's the way to grow. I mean, if you don't look at yourself objectively and try to fix things and go over some of those items that uh, that you're uncomfortable with, or if you're a little nervous, if that's yeah. probably the direction you should go, that's some area yep. you should probably explore. And, you know, we have so many ways to be entertained and just kind of keep going through the days, but, uh, you know, those things will just make yourself better. And if that's what you're looking for, that's what I would, I would definitely recommend at least trying to get there. And if you can't get there yourself, just have somebody ask you some very basic questions and you'll, you'll, you'll get there eventually. So my last question, um, I, I end every podcast this way, is how would you like to be remembered? Now, the first two things that popped into my head were a, a guy with an unholy fixation on the truth or and if some version of sort of generosity around, like um, didn't always put himself first. And that that's 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 who you want to be and that's that's how i was uh, that's how i was raised my b both my parents were um uh they met in divinity school so they were both in training to be uh, uh ministers my mother never got ordained but she ended up getting uh, three graduate degrees and my dad was a um civil rights activist and um he was he marched at selma he was arrested with the freedom riders and he, how do you want to be remembered like you you fought for the healthiest part of what homo sapiens are. And, and so that's something we can all do. You know, I'm not going to ever, uh, you know, fill those shoes. Like I, I wasn't out at risk of getting beaten up in, in, uh, in racial protests in 1961, the way he was, but, um, you know, do the right thing and do the right thing when it's painful. That's how I, I, I'd love to be remembered as just that, that fixation on the truth with, hopefully a little of it bleeding into a kind of compassionate version of the truth. Cause the truth can be harsh and nasty and the truth without compassion is, is not all that grand a thing. So it's a very powerful message. And Patrick, it's a huge pleasure to have you on the establishing your, your empire podcast. I love all the different areas we went to. It was, I mean, it was just a really enjoyable to have you on. Uh, thank you. It was my, my pleasure. Enjoyed, uh, all the parts of life and, and, you know, how to be a good human that, that, that we covered. And, and I, I had a great time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. 